rotates around the axis, and all of them just rotate around. In every basis, this, the modes rotate. OK, so just as a reminder, this lecture is going to be, I'm going to touch on a recent experiment we did where we sent uh, this high dimensional entanglement that I've been talking about through a complex medium, in this case, uh, multimode fiber. And, and then I will start uh, tell you a little bit about uh, multi-photon entanglement in high dimensions, so more than two. Uh, and if, if time permitting, a, little, a few slides on free space quantum communication and classical communication. OK, so let's start with uh, unscrambling entanglement through a complex medium. So with, with uh, quantum comms, <coughs> I like to think that we are at an early stage uh, harking back to the days of classical communication when we, you know, struggled with, with things like storms and, and bad detectors and things. And, 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 and so we have to overcome similar problems with quantum communications. Uh, for example, dealing with, with noisy channels is, is, is a huge issue. And a, a complex medium, essentially a scattering medium, acts as a noisy channel. So what do I mean by complex media? Oh, this is very trigger happy here. Okay. Um, so you know, anything can be a complex scattering medium, from paint on a wall to your teeth to sugar cubes. Essentially, modes go in, they mix up, scatter in some ways, and come out uh, in a different basis or with loss. A multimode fiber is a more controlled complex medium in that it's fairly unitary. There's no loss, little loss. But the modes go in and come out all sorts of mixed. If you've ever seen light coupled into a multimode fiber, it comes out with a speckle pattern, laser light. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of effort being made in trying to overcome this scattering for things like uh, classical communications. So SDM is space division multiplexing. We are at the stage where the classical data crunch is happening, and we want to push more and more information so that we can all watch YouTube videos of cats doing funny things. But um, one of the ways that people are going to do this is by, are, are doing it currently, is by putting lots of spatial modes into, into a fiber. And people have reached terabits per second by space division multiplexing. And this was a, a work done by some people in, in uh, Scotland, actually, at the time where they <coughs> uh, figured out how to send images through a 30 centimeter section of a multimode fiber. So that's real data that you're seeing there. And, and you can see as the fiber is bent, the image stays the same pretty much. And so you know, we wanted to do something similar in the quantum regime. So I want to talk a little bit about what, wh how people do this classically. So uh, a complex medium is described by a, a tr complex transmission matrix which is basically a set of uh, complex coefficients that, that map a set of input modes to a set of output modes. So a lens has a very simple transmission matrix. A sugar cube would have millions, perhaps more, uh, complex uh, coefficients that, that, that make up this transmission matrix. So using this device that I've been talking about, a spatial light modulator, people can map the, or, or measure the transmission matrix of a complex medium quite simply by sending in a basis of probe states. So they prepare a set of probe states, i, and, and measure a set of output states, j, which then allows them to re retrieve the complex coefficients t, i, j. Now, of course, there's some phase retrieval involved because measuring j here, you would measure the intensity. So in order to get the phase of the t, i, j, you would have to do some additional work. Uh, but in the end, you get something like this. Of course, I'm showing you an absolute value here. And this is all uh, very, very nicely described in this early paper for, by Sylvain Giga. Uh, once you find the transmission matrix, you can construct a set of eigenmodes, uh, <clears throat> which is essentially equivalent to a singular value decomposition or uh, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but basically, you find the inverse of the transmission matrix. And you can either prepare a set of eigenmodes, or you can rotate, uh, uh, prepare a unitary transformation after the complex medium uh, to basically send information through this scattering, scattering medium. So let's move to quantum mechanics for a second. Uh, 
in quantum mechanics, we have this thing called channel state duality, <coughs> where, which basically says that statements about a state can be mapped to statements about a channel. So if you imagine this scenario where you have a maximally entangled state, and now you're, you should be fairly familiar with this ii uh, 1 over root d state, and if you put one particle of this maximally entangled state through a, a complex medium or a channel in this case, uh, <clears throat> essentially the resulting state rho captures all the information about the t, right? So the maths looks like this. Uh, you have rho equals identity tensor t. Identity acts on one particle and t acts on the other particle. And the resulting state rho then encodes t, essentially. Right, this is called the choi jamilkowski isomorphism. I'm sure I'm saying, still saying that wrong because there's a, a slash across the L and I know that's not an L. So um, proposed independently by these two brilliant theorists in the 70s. And so we're going to use this uh, interesting feature uh, to, to, to recover our, our, our entanglement. So I, I told you how one can use a set of probe states to measure t. What we do instead is we, we send one entangled state, uh, or prepare one entangled state, and we send one of them through our, our one, one particle from the state through our complex medium. And so the resulting state phi t, now I'm assuming it's a pure state here, uh, encodes all the information about the, the, the channel. Now you can do, uh, well, a few things. If you want to recover your input state phi plus, you can prepare an inverse t inverse and apply it here, right? Uh, or, which would then diagonalize uh, your, your uh, channel and you would essentially recover your correlations. Uh, however, there's an interesting property of maximally entangled states that allows you to do something interesting, perhaps clever. Uh, if you take two operations on a maximally entangled state, you can move the operation on one particle onto the other particle or vice versa. So A tensor B can be written as B transpose, it's actually complex conjugate uh, or conjugate transpose, A tensor I or I tensor B A transpose. Right, what this allows us to do is, instead of unscrambling Bob, you can scramble Alice and recover your state. So even though Bob's photon went through a, 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 a scrambling channel T, you can put a, 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 a scrambling operation on Alice, and you will get back your entanglement. This is a unique feature of entanglement in that the entanglement doesn't actually go away. It's just rotated in funny ways. So if one photon is messed up, you mess up the other photon in a clever way and you get back your entanglement. Okay, so let's start with the initial state. As before, <clears throat> we have a crystal pumped with a, a carefully shaped pump laser and then we measure correlations uh, uh, between Alice and Bob in this macro pixel basis. This is one basis, this is the mutually unbiased basis. We measure very nice correlations and this allows us to certify a fidelity of 94% uh, or so in this seven dimensional mode space, which says we are entangled in seven dimensions. Now, uh, when we put one of the photons through a multimode fiber, the following happens, right? The data looks terrible. You have no correlations. But if you think back to what I told you about the, the channel state duality, you remember, uh, you, we, we realized this later actually, this, this data that is, doesn't have any entanglement actually encodes information about the fiber in two different bases. And um, so the correlations that are lost actually tell us what the fiber is doing to some extent, right? Absolute value. So what we need to do is actually recover the entire transmission matrix from, from these, this, this uh, scrambled data. And the way we do this is we prepare a reference mode that co-propagates with the state going through the photon going through the fiber. Actually, it doesn't matter on which, which photon you have the reference. It's a two-photon state. Whatever you do here can also be done here. Um, so we use the space between our pixels as a reference mode, and we phase step the reference. And without going into too much detail, we recover uh, 
what we call the S matrix, which is the T matrix of the fiber times some diagonal matrix that, that encode, that, that we need to recover. Okay? And then we recover the, this diagonal matrix through another reference mode process. Uh, and with this information of the S and the E, we get our complex T. Okay, so the T looks like this, a real part, imaginary part. And if, if you remember, I guess I could go back a few slides. It's quite similar to this, right? Looking similar, at least. That. And so what we do is we take this information of our measured our T and we prepare a, a, a new basis on Alice's side. Uh, so now I'm doing the, now I'm, I'm me essentially messing up Alice in a clever way such that the photon that's going through the fiber comes back to being maximally entangled. Uh, and this is what we see. We see this messed up data is now perfectly correlated again which was really nice. And this fiber is actually just a, a fiber we bought from Thor Labs, right? Two meter long, just a commercial multi-mode fiber that supports a few hundred modes. So we are kind of only act, uh, looking in the seven mode subspace of the, of the fiber. So this is not enough to certify entanglement. To certify entanglement, as I told you before, you need at least two bases. So we take the information about our transmission matrix and we rotate it using some maths to access the transmission matrix in, in all the other mutually unbiased bases of our, of our seven dim mode space. And doing that, we find we can get correlations back in all the, the eight mobs of this pixel mode space. And with this, we can certify a fairly high fidelity that tells us we have six dimensional entanglement. Um, oh, that was too quick. So I just wanted to point out that this work oh, was done uh, in collaboration with a colleague of mine in Glasgow, uh, Hugo Defien, and then, of course, people from my group. And we had a summer student visiting who's actually starting his PhD with me uh, in September. OK, uh, any questions about that? I know I've kind of rushed through that a little bit. Yes. Yeah, so we, the question was, did we have any problems of scattering or absorption in the fiber? We lose modes to other higher order, order modes, right? The fiber can support a few hundred modes, like I said. So light does scatter out. So we are basically only looking at the, the light, the photons that are left in our mode subspace. It, the idea eventually is to try and access the entire mode space of the fiber. In fact, it's not that big. For, at telecom, it's about 45 modes for a standard, uh, like, a grin fiber. Uh, so we do lose photons, but it doesn't hurt us. It's, it, as, long as, it's, as long as the loss is kind of uh, flat across the, across the spectrum. How many photon streams are these? How, how bright is it? You mean how, how, how many counts do we have? Uh, oh, oh, it's two, fo it's two photon so entanglement. It's photon here, yes, yes. And what's the bit rate or like count rate? Uh, I think we had a few, a few thousand counts per second in, in one mode. Okay, so I want to move on to three qubits, essentially tell you about uh, how do we entangle more than two particles. And I'm going to start with a broad sort of introduction about um, multi-photon entanglement and why it's important and how do we do it. So uh, if we think back to like the first days of entanglement, uh, you know, we've all uh, heard about the EPR paradox and the EPR paper. Um, but so, e so Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen proposed this idea, which funnily enough didn't get much mileage I think it had like four citations until the 60s. Uh, but they were not bad citations. One of them was by Bohr, 
and the other one was by Schrodinger. So good citations to have. Uh, but then in the 60s, uh, John Bell came about and, and proposed a test of, of uh, entanglement, essentially, right? which we all know as Bell's inequalities. And this was a, this was a statistical test of quantum mechanics um, that allowed you to make a series of measurements on an entangled state that ruled out any local hidden variable theories. Essentially, that said that the correlations we are seeing cannot be nature playing tricks. Um, it is inherently non-local, or you have to give up either locality or reality. I'm not going to go into too much, too much detail on that subject. The main point is that oof, the main point is that it was a statistical test. So in order to measure Bell's, uh, Bell's parameter, S, you had to make a series of measurements on both particles that allowed you to then reconstruct uh, construct, uh, this parameter, which then tests whether nature is acting in this manner. So in the 1980s, early 90s, Greenberger, Horn, and Seilinger, seen here in order, Greenberger, Horn, Seilinger, uh, proposed a, a new test of, of uh, non-locality that is a non-statistical test. Essentially, it's one measurement that tells you, it, it's called an all or nothing test. So it rules out this idea of having to do a series of tests on entanglement that tells you whether nature behaves in this strange manner or not. And the main point is that it required three particles, three or more particles to be entangled. And uh, so here I'm showing you a, a three-partite G at Z state, right? And then uh, Merman proposed uh, an equality, just like Bell proposed a, a, a test of, of this uh, two-photon or two-particle entanglement. Merman proposed an inequality which required you to measure joint observables on all three particles. Uh, of, these are essentially sigma x and sigma y. And if you measured a Merman parameter between 0 and 2, then it was explained by local hidden variable theories. Measuring it between 2 and 4 implied that nature behaves in a non-local manner. OK. So what are the current records of multipartite entanglement? Uh, uh, this, this is possibly a little bit outdated, because every year, Jan Pan's group adds a few photons. Um, and possibly a few students and postdocs <laughs> to the experiments. And so 12 photons have been entangled uh, in China. Uh, people have entangled up to 20 ions, although I say 5 and 20 because they only showed entanglement between any 5 in 20 ions uh, in Innsbruck. And people have entangled, again, in China, up to 20 superconducting qubits. Although Google may have done more, but we don't know. Uh, Right. So all of these describe a state such as this, where you have zero t tensor n, right? Uh, n times zero, uh, plus one n times one uh, g at z. What about high dimensional multipartite entanglement? People haven't really explored this, and I'll tell you why. So the simplest extension is, of course, you take your uh, two, two, uh, two dimensional g at z state and extend it to three dimensions, right? So you have a, I call this a 3-3-3 state, and I'll tell you why. Uh, or uh, what happens is, um, well, okay, I'm describing these states in terms of these sets of states. So here's my set of 2-2-2 two, two, two states, and here's my set of 3-3-3 three, three, three states. When you go to higher dimensions than 2 and part, more particles than 2, a funny thing happens. And actually, this is going back to a question somebody asked me earlier about Schmidt rank being, um, being different, or, or Schmidt rank for, for multipartite states. What, what is a Schmidt rank for multipartite states? It's described by a Schmidt rank vector. And this, in fact, is the Schmidt rank vector. So the Schmidt rank vector is the rank of every bipartition. So if I look at the bipartition of this particle A with respect to BC, the rank is 3, and so on and so forth. So this is an example of a state where the Schmidt rank vector is not symmetric. So it's a 3-3-2 state. And quite simply put, one of the particles lives in a two-dimensional space, while the other two live in a three-dimensional space. Right? And this is 
in the middle of this, these two sets of states. Uh, that's basically explaining the, what I just said, the, 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 the Schmidt rank vector, essentially. Um, now, there are many states possible, right? There's 3, 3, 2, there's 4, 2, 2. They, there is a vast family, and they obey a certain relationship, which, again, is all explained in, that, in, in the reference in the earlier slide. So how do you create states such as these? So this, this very nice paper from the mid-90s, uh, in fact, I asked Anton uh, uh, who came up with it. He's like, oh, it was Marek. Marek Zhukowski is a senior scientist in Poland. And so this is um, a, a very nice idea of basically producing multipartite entanglement from erasing information, right? So what you do is you, you have phot entangled photons produced in two different crystals, and you combine them in such a way that you cannot, in principle, know where, which crystal they came from. Uh, I can show you how this works for polarization. So a PBS, a polarizing beam splitter, as we all know, it, it transmits horizontal, it reflects vertical, right? If I come in with another photon from the other side, uh, it will do the same, transmit horizontal, reflect vertical, right? So it mixes polarization components of two in input photons. Now, what happens when you send an entangled state through it? So particle two will, will go through, and particle three will go through the, the PBS. There are a few possible outcomes. Either horizontal from particle two is, is transmitted and transmitted from particle three, which then uh, imposes the condition that particle four must be H and particle one must be H because of the entanglement correlations currently. Right? Or particle 3 is reflected and particle 2 is reflected and they're both vertical, which then imposes the condition that particle 1 must be vertical and particle 4 must be vertical. So post-selecting on these four detectors clicking together, these are the only two possible outcomes. You either have uh, HHHH or VVVV, right? And this is your four photon GZ state. Now, if you remember back to my last talk, I was talking about coherence the importance of coherence in entanglement. And what I have described so far is just classical correlations, right? You either have all H or all V. This plus sign here is crucial. And in order to certify that you actually have coherence, you have to do a lot of things. You have to make sure, uh, well, okay, I'll tell you. On, 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 but, but the test of that is you have to do a basis rotation and look for correlations in the, in the other basis. Right, so this, this setup that I just showed you is the one that's basically been extended uh, in these 12 massive photon experiments, uh, 12 photon entanglement experiments in China. You can almost see one crystal cascaded onto two, three, four, five, and, and so on and so forth. So why were people able to do this uh, for polarization? It's because there are tools that exist for polarization, like the, the PBS, right? And also half-wave plates, which can do basis rotations uh, from horizontal vertical to anti-diagonal. Uh, so the challenge for, uh, in doing this for other degrees of freedom or higher dimensional degrees of freedom is to, is to create beam splitters, essentially multi-port devices that can uh, do the same thing for spatial modes or temporal modes for that matter. So such a device does exist. In fact, was invented back in 2002 in Miles Paget's group and Johannes Kortiel's group. Uh, it's a Mach Zender interferometer, and it consists of two dove prisms in each arm, one rotated with respect to the other. And a dove prism is a device that basically is an image rotator. So if you go in with, with an image, it rotates it by twice the angle at which the dove prism is, is uh, oriented. Now, thinking back to your uh, quantum mechanics 101, right, rotations and angular momentum are connected. So, generator of rotations. Um, so, when you rotate a mode carrying angular momentum, 
you also impart a phase that depends on the angular momentum. So rotating this mode here gives you a phase of pi. Rotating this mode here by 90 degrees gives you a phase of 3 pi, which is pi modulus 2 pi. So you can almost see what happens. Odd modes interfere destructively. Even modes interfere constructively so that this device sorts uh, spatial modes into even and odd values. Right? And you can scale this up to many modes. It's just not very practical. So this is an example of a multi-outcome mode sorter for OAM, but not very practical because you need cascaded interferometers. So this is a, a picture of the device made in, in my lab. Right? You can see the dove prisms on rotation stages, beam splitters, and, and this is data going in with these two modes gives us uh, aw, even, odd, and going in from this way gives us odd, even. So it was proposed as a, as a mode sorter, but the key step to using it for entanglement experiments was to use the other input port, right? Uh, if you use the other input port, it's a mode combiner and a mode mixer. Right, so let's see what happens if we put this device in the middle of our high dimensional entanglement crystals, now two crystals, each producing a three dimensional state. This is one minus one zero zero minus one one and the same thing here. Right, there's a few possibilities. Oh, and I'm going to use the fourth photon as a, a trigger uh, to, to herald the presence of my three photon entangled state. So one option is that photon C is transmitted through this Let's imagine this as a big beam splitter. And photon B is transmitted in mode 0, 0. So even modes are transmitted, which then would herald photon D in being in mode 0. Or I have odd photons reflected. So mode uh, 1B is reflected, mode 1C is reflected, which then, or uh, mode 1B is reflected and mode minus 1C is reflected. Now remember, it's, this, is being, this is the herald, so there is no mode minus 1b, right? And th measuring these modes here imposes a condition that you have minus 1 and 1 over there. So these are our th only three possibilities. Combining them and looking a bit more closely, you find that this is exactly this 3-3-2 state that, that actually, when we were not planning to create this, Funnily enough, we were trying to create a three-dimensional GZ state, but this is uh, one of those good cases of happenstance. Um, so you'll notice that you have one, one, minus one, zero, 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 one, minus one, one. Photon B is in a two-dimensional space, zero and one. Photon C and D are in a three-dimensional space. Now the key question is, is this in a coherent superposition or is it just a classical mixture? The way you test for that is through two photon interference. In fact, it's four photon interference. But uh, again, Benny showed this in his talk. Just to remind you, uh, Hongo Mandel interference. If two photons arrive at a beam splitter, there are four possibilities. They are either both transmitted, both reflected, and one reflected, one transmitted, and, and the same for the other case. And again, uh, these two possibilities destructively interfere. They cancel out. So the only thing left is both photons going this way bo or both photons going this way. This is known as bunching, photon bunching. Uh, and it's particular to bosons. Bosons like to stick together. Um, and if you scan the, one of the paths here, you'll find this dip. right? And then the dip is not always. Uh, perfect, and at, that's a, the key point here. The key point is that the, the, the dip not going down to zero depends on how distinguishable the two photons are. So if this photon looks a little bit different from this one in any particular degree of freedom, right, spectrum, polarization, free, uh, spatial mode, you will not get very good interference. And this is essentially what then limits the coherence of your state. So we have to now look for um, hongo mandel interference in a spatial mode basis, kind of. So what we do is we measure in a superposition basis using spatial light modulators, 
And we find that we, 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 so this is, again, the basis rotation I was talking about. And we scan one of these path lengths. And we measure for a few hours. Right? We see nothing. And then we run the experiment a bit longer. This takes a lot of patience, by the way. Uh, after two days, you see a dip appearing. And it's like, oh my god, is this working? Um, so, so after two days, we, we saw a sign that, OK, I've marked it as 15 now, but you know, it was some arbitrary position. So that tells us that this is the point where we have the perfect sort of condition of alignment and, and distinguishability. It's not perfect, perfect, but it's pretty close. So once, once, we, have, once we see this, we sort of have a sense that our, our state is in a coherent superposition. The setup, actual setup, looks much bigger. It spans a big table. Uh, and uh, if I can show you in some more detail, uh, it consists of a pulsed uh, pump laser, which is then dub frequency doubled to blue in a, in a BBO crystal. And then the blue laser, UV laser, pumps two PPKTP crystals. Uh, the detection is done with spatial light modulators and intensity and single mode fibers. Um, and then we have to be very careful about imaging and, and mode matching. So we have imaging systems everywhere. Uh, and, and, and this Mach Zender that I showed you earlier, the OEM beam splitter, had to be designed in such a way that it could be stable for several days. So we designed it in a folded Sanya configuration. So this is a Mach Zender. It doesn't look like one, but it is. And it's sort of a double path Sanyak interferometer. So any changes in path length are sort of self-compensating. Uh, lots of lenses. So anyway, you get the picture. It, 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 was, it, it took us a year or so right, to, to get this to work. So now that we have this condition of perfect coherence, hopefully, you know, it doesn't prove that, we, that our state is entangled in three, three, two dimensions. It just says that we have some coherence in some subspace. So to verify that the state is actually entangled, you can reconstruct the whole state. But this would take ages, especially since our count rate is so low. Uh, so we need a, a, an entanglement witness that can basically um, prove that the state that we measure cannot be decomposed into entangled states of a smaller dimensionality structure, essentially ruling out that our correlations could have come from 3, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, or bi biseparable, bipartite states. So this is <clears throat> similar to the witness I told you before, but it's a little bit uh, simpler in, 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 not simpler in the sense, but it, it's measured differently. <clears throat> it's a fidelity witness, excuse me, <clears throat> it's a fidelity witness, but it, uh, it measures the fidelity not with MUBs, but with two dim subspace measurements. So the way it works is you, you measure a state, <clears throat> and you calculate, well, before you measure the state, you take an ideal state from the, 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 the space of three two two states, and you calculate the fidelity of the ideal state three two two with the ideal state three three two, and you find this to be maximal value of two thirds. Uh, and then you take your experimentally created state, which hopefully is here, and you calculate the fidelity of your, your experimentally created state with, a, with an ideal state. To do this, you need to measure a certain number of density matrix elements. Ooh. Right, 18, well, OK, I kind of went too quickly. Um, Right, so you need to measure 18 diagonal elements and three off-diagonal elements. Um, the density matrix of this state has 171 elements. Uh, the three diagonals and the three off-diagonals that we expect to be non-zero are the following, right? And in the lab, as I've told you before, you can only do projective measurements. So the diagonal measurements, uh, the diagonal elements are measured straightforwardly. You just put 0, 0, 0 on all three SLMs, and you get this diagonal element. 
for the off diagonals, as I explained before, you have to break them down into uh, measurable quantities. Uh, so I will not go into too much detail, but just an example of the real part of one of these off diagonals requires you to measure this monster, which can then be decomposed into projective measurements in the two-dimensional subspaces and so on and so forth. So just the real part requires 32 measurements, and the imaginary part requires another 32 measurements. So each off-diagonal requires 64 projective measurements. If you multiply that by 171, you can see where this is going. So that's why tomography is prohibitive, but the witness only requires us to measure three. Right, so let's go back to this, this witness. Uh, we took data for four days, and we find that our expected um, density matrix elements look like this. The off-diagonals are fairly sizable, which means that our state is coherent in, in, this, in these probability amplitudes, and we get a fidelity of about 80%, right? Which means that our state is above this bound of two-thirds, and hence, it can only be explained by entanglement in three times three times two dimensions. Okay, so what do you do with a state like this, right? It's, it's beautiful, in my opinion. I don't think it needs to be uh, used for anything, necessarily. But, you know, we like to get money from the government. So, uh, one possibility is to do layered quantum cryptography. Essentially, the idea here is as follows. Um, you can have secure communication where three parties share multiple layers of information. So Alice and Bob can share, have an extra key that is not known to Carol. So Alice and Bob could share a message, sorry, Alice and Bob and Carol could share a message, and then Alice and Bob could share a second layer of message or key that is not known to Carol. That's just one sort of cute idea. So, what about three-dimensional GHZ, right? That's still not, um, we're still not there yet. Uh, we, we, we searched for a while to get to this, this state. We, we tried on paper to figure out different setups and how do you actually produce a state that looks like this to no avail. Uh, until we decided to try a different approach, uh, this was a while ago, it was three, four years ago now, um, where we said, why don't we get a computer to do it, right? Clearly, our brains are not up to the task of combining lots of optical elements and seeing how modes mix. So we took a toolbox of elements that we programmed. This is a beam splitter, this is a mirror, this is a spiral phase plate, this is an OEM beam splitter, and we told the computer to create random setups. Calculate the, the resulting quantum state, analyze its properties, including things like its dimensionality of entanglement, and we also use it to, to come up with ways to do unitary transformations. If it satisfied the criteria, if it didn't satisfy the criteria, start again with a random setup. If it did, try and simplify the setup, and then finally learn the setup and go back to the toolbox. So basically save that setup in the toolbox and, create, and use it to create more random setups. So while looking for the 333 state, we found that not only did we find the 333 state, we found about 51 other high dimensional entangled states or ways to create them, right? So that's what the 333 setup looks like. It's really simple in the end. We're like, why couldn't we figure this out? Uh, and that's what a 1065 setup looks like. So that's a spiral phase plate that shifts the mode by minus five and this is minus two. Uh, this is an OEM beam splitter. This is a regular beam splitter. Uh, these ones were states that were not found, and these are states that are not allowed uh, to exist. So this is what the setup looks like. We got it to work after another uh, huge effort in the lab, um, <clears throat> because now it involves hongo mandel interference not only here, but also here. So it's quite a challenge to actually make, make it work. And this is where, actually, going back to Benny's talk, you realize that you don't necessarily want to keep doing this with bulk optics, you find, so, which is why we are trying to do other things. Um, 
So again, <clears throat> I'm not going to explain every detail about this, about the setup. If you're interested, you know, we do, you can look at the paper, but just to give you a, the gist of it, we start with two entangled states, and here I'm showing you kind of a graph that shows you that you start with a tensor product of these two entangled states, where you have a connection between every possible probability amplitude, and then this part of the setup removes certain connections, and then finally, uh, this part of the setup results in this, in this state, which looks like a three-dimensional GHZ state. And actually, this will tell you why we couldn't find it, because we weren't looking for a state that, like this. We were looking for a symmetric state. And the computer, the condition we gave the computer was, find us a state that's three-dim entangled, um, uh, but it, we didn't say it must be symmetric. Right? So the computer found a state that was highly asymmetric, but each particle lived in a three-dimensional space. So minus three, minus two, one, minus one, zero, one, and the same for the third. Uh, this experiment involved multi-mode in Hom interference between several different modes. I'm not going to go into detail here. Uh, and the actual setup looked like this, right? It was uh, two main components. We had to develop a much brighter source of uh, four-photon entanglement, uh, four-photon correlations, and then this, this massive 27-dimensional uh, multiport, essentially. 27 because it was three OM modes raised to the power of three paths. So we verified 333 entanglement in the same way as before, uh, except this time it took 21 days to measure. <laughs> uh, um, and, and we also did these Merman uh, non-locality tests, right, uh, between, in each two dim subspace. And we found that, that there was entanglement across every, in every two-dimensional subspace. The people who did this was Manuel, who recently finished his PhD, or is almost finished with his PhD with, with Anton, and Mario Kren, who is in Canada now. OK, so that brings me to the last few slides of my talk, which is, uh, you know, we're doing all this stuff with spatial modes. What about actually doing some real experiments outside the lab, where we try to send spatial modes of light across real distance and see whether you can actually use them, not only in fibers, but actually to communicate with satellites, let's say, or you know, Earth links. So this is a photo of myself and a, and a colleague. We're catching an OEM mode uh, on the rooftop of our building in Vienna uh, after it propagated for three kilometers over, over this, the city. And we were trying to guide, at the time, we were trying to guide it into the telescope. Um, and I'm on the phone, actually, telling my, my friends to move the, the mode a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. <laughs> Um, and this was the experiment. You can see the beam going from this uh, one old radio tower that was not being used, uh, where we set up the, the sender, and we sent it across to, to the institute building. Very simple setup. And, and with this, we were able to uh, send, basically, information encoded in classical modes. Uh, and then we took this experiment to the Canary Islands and to see if, how long could spatial modes of light survive uh, over the ocean. So 143 kilometers. This is a long exposure. I, I took 25 seconds of, of uh, Hermit Gauss mode. So this is a superposition of plus and minus 1 OAM, or Hermit Gauss mode 0, 01, uh, propagating 143 kilometers to the island of Tenerife. And, and actually, you can even see the Milky Way. Um, it, was, it, was, it was fun. I would say, but then a storm came, and then everything was, was gone. Um, this is what the mode looks like after propagating for 143 kilometers. Uh, it's huge. So again, not necessarily practical, uh, but it's, it's, this is the, the mode on the wall of the telescope, right? So we're, not, we're, no, we're beyond the point of trying to get it into the telescope, but we have it on the telescope. Uh, and we encoded a simple message and it was received with a slight grammatical error. Right. So what are the open problems in this field of high dimensional quantum photonics? Uh, one is manipulation. We need to figure out how to do simple things like half wave plates, quarter wave plates in high dimensions, rotations. We've made some strides towards doing this, but there's still a lot of 
room for improvement. Um, how to generate them and measure them, both the theory and the experiment. Uh, transporting them, I showed you some things uh, about transporting spatial entanglement through a fiber. Uh, to couple them with quantum states of matter. And finally, the, the theory of how to measure uh, entanglement, how to certify high dimensional entanglement, both for non-locality as well as things like steering. So these are various things that, that my group works on right now. OK, uh, any questions? I bore everybody at the end. 